Hi everybody and welcome to a very special episode of Beyond the Grid. My name's Tom Clarkson and coming up in this week's show, we're celebrating Formula One's birthday. Because May the 13th, that's today if you're listening to the podcast on the day of release, is the 70th anniversary of Formula One's first ever race at Silverstone. That first Grand Prix, over 70 laps of course, was won by Giuseppe Farina for Alfa Romeo and he would go on to win the inaugural 1950 World Championship. Since then, there have been seven decades of inspiration and innovation. There have been 1,018 glorious races and a roster of driving talent during all that time that beggars belief. Think Fangio, Clark, Stewart, Lauda, Prost, Senna, Schumacher, Hamilton, to name just a handful. Unfortunately, we're no longer able to talk to many of the great drivers, particularly from the earlier decades, but we can talk about their cars, and we have the perfect throttle jockey to guide us through these seven decades of Formula One cars, Martin Brundle. Martin raced in 158 Grand Prix across 12 years, taking nine podiums along the way. And since retiring from Formula One, he hasn't stopped driving. Anything but, in fact. He's one of the few people on the planet to have driven cars, race-winning cars, from every decade in the sport's illustrious history. Many for his job on Sky Sports F1. And those who watch Sky F1 will know he's just as good at talking about cars as he is driving them. I want to know what makes a good car good, if the fundamentals have changed over the years, and what it took to get the best out of them. So here you go. Brundle on the best cars he's driven from each decade. Expect Mercedes, McLarens, Ferraris and Lotuses, and perhaps a few surprises too. And to help you follow along at home, head to FormulaOne.com to see all of the cars Martin talks about on the show. Martin, it's great to have you on the show. How are you? Yeah, I feel good. I um, hope everybody's well and their friends and family and colleagues. Uh, strange times we're going through. Uh, I'm a little bit stir crazy stuck at home because I'm so used to circulating the world as a driver or with the TV or whatever we do. Although I've been very lucky to be with the lockdown with the family in Norfolk. Now, what a landmark moment this is. The 70th anniversary of Formula One. That's seven decades of inspiration and innovation. And as well as your 158 races that you did in Formula One and those nine podiums, you've also driven an incredible number of Formula One cars, haven't you? What's the total now? It's 54. I, I have a sneaky suspicion there's one or two more that I drove at Goodwood or such like. But over the years, either as uh, either I raced in them or I've since driven them for TV uh, features or up the hill at Goodwood, uh, magazine features. Uh, yeah, I've been very lucky and I, I've been in cars from all of those decades. And it's fascinating to compare them and the rate of change particularly. And, and the great cars that I've driven all had one defining factor and that they had this beautiful balance, this predictability, drivability. You could feel, you know, the really, truly great cars want to work with the driver. Some of them are pretty quirky in terms of gearboxes and pedals and, and the way you sit in them. But generally speaking, you've always understood why it turned out to be a winning car. And has the driver always wanted the same thing from a car? Did Juan Manuel Fangio want the same thing in the 50s? that Lewis Hamilton wants today? I think fundamentally the challenge is the same. Uh, you have mostly four wheels. I did drive a six-wheeler Williams in there. Um, you find the limit of the grip and you drive to it as long as you can, as, as hard and as fast as you can. And there's a device to turn the front wheels called the steering wheel, some kind of mechanism to shift the gears. And that is it. You And you drive to or just over the limit of that grip. You want balance and predictability. You, you, If you can, you don't want the car to surprise you because you'll crash too often. Um, so yes, I think the absolute basics have, have remained exactly the same. It's just the drivers have had to finesse their styles through the decades to go and find the optimum place for the tools that have got available and the way the cars shift gear or the way they put the power down, particularly drivability, reliability. And one thing I've noticed is even or certainly through the phase where I was a racer through to today where I drive them for Sky F1, 
is how much better the front end of the cars are. You know, you, you, we went through various stages of understeer most of our careers uh, a, a few decades ago. Now the cars really do stick to the road. You turn the wheel and you get a proportional response from the steering wheel. Let's start by looking at the 1950s. The Second World War is over, but it continues to cast a long shadow while Europe is reconstructed under the Marshall Plan. But entertainment is on the rise. This decade marks the arrival of Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe and Humphrey Bogart. And sport is once again de rigueur. In Formula One, the World Championship is born in 1950. Italian teams dominate the early years, including Ferrari, who continue to be a leading light today. And there's another similarity to today, the dominance of Mercedes. Martin, you started your career in touring cars, actually in the same team as Sir Sterling Moss. Let's begin by talking about the car in which Sterling won his first Grand Prix in 1955, the Mercedes W196. What was that like? I've driven two versions of it. Uh, Mercedes used to bring along uh, what they called their old timers to Grand Prix, and they asked me to drive them from time to time. I remember driving the W196 at Spa. It was sort of sprinkling with rain. And uh, Jochen Mass was driving the pace car at the time, and I didn't realise, but he was supposed to be followed me out in the five-litre SEC, you know, super-duper safe uh, pace car thing. And I went around, I was enjoying it so much that when I eventually came back into the pit lane, which was at the bottom of Eau Rouge, where they were storing the cars, running the cars from, he turned up about half a minute later, all red-faced, like puffing. He'd been trying to keep up with me. I had no idea I was supposed to wait for him, but it just shows you the speed of those cars. So they're narrow, they're slippery. They didn't have a huge amount of power, sort of 250 horsepower or such like, but they were so good through the air. They gathered speed so quickly. You sit astride them and it, it's really odd in the beginning how splayed out your legs are where the clutch pedal ones are this massive transmission tunnel and then the brake and throttle on the other side the the first and enduring challenge of driving a w196 is the gearbox because it's sort of mirrored in how you'd normally expect it to be in that in a normal manual if you went from second to third you'd sort of dog leg from the bottom of the gearbox across and up well that would be going second to fifth in a W196 and you really have to put a different chip in your brain to get used to the box and as you're trundling around I also then drove the the 196 Streamliner or type Monza with Lewis at Silverstone last year same car with the but with the bodywork on the the only Grand Prix car ever it won three races the Streamliner to win races with covered wheels because we don't normally you know single seaters is open cockpit open wheels isn't it and, and of course, Fangio knocked all the oil drums out of the way and bent the front of that streamliner at Silverstone because he, he couldn't really see the extremities of the car. But they're gloriously beautiful. They are unquestionably priceless. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's quite a, an honour and a responsibility to drive a car like that. And, and off you go. And I remember slithering around Spa and around Silverstone in those two. And immediately you start, especially at Spa, as I was going through Blanchiment, sort of four-wheel drifting, you immediately realise how vulnerable you are. You haven't got any seatbelts on. You've got no crash protection. You are sitting astride this transmission tunnel. You know if you hit something hard, you'd just submarine down into the cockpit and they'd have to pour you out afterwards. And quite quickly I realised that if you thought, if it was going to start to go wrong, jump out. I could see why they did that. I could see why they hoped to be thrown clear of the car if it crashed, because that was your best chance to survive. So you immediately felt those kind of vulnerabilities and challenges. And, and on the gearbox, I, I tried to give Lewis a heads up that uh, third and fifth are up and second and fourth is down. Because yes, you can go second to fifth really easily and feel an idiot. The scary thing is it's easy to go fifth to second and over revved the engine. And Lewis was like, it won't be a problem. And then I drove the car first and he was sort of taking the mickey out of me a little bit because I was fumbling the gears as I came past uh, the pits the first couple of times, trying to remember where these gears were. And of course he got in and did exactly the same thing. He was, he was slightly contrite after that. 
So just challenging and, and brilliant. Sorry, very long answer to a short question. A no, brilliant answer. And, and can you see why that car won nine of the 12 races it entered? I think it was ahead of its time, wasn't it? They were using direct fuel injection from the Messerschmitt, I think, warplanes. Um, I mean, it, it, it was just a piece of engineering uh, for the time. Yes, I can see why it won so many races. It was just so comprehensively engineered it, it was only two and a half liters a straight eight but sadly because of the 1955 Le Mans crash everything Mercedes withdrew at the end of that year didn't they and um, otherwise I think it would have gone on to much greater things but it comes back to the point I made early on about the balance and about the drivability and commanding position you have from the cockpit and I can see why it just ran and hid in the distance. Fangio jumped ship from Maserati to Mercedes mid-1954. And then he went on later to say that the Mercedes W196 wasn't as nice to drive as the Maserati 250F, which is another car you've driven. Can you compare and contrast the two for us? Yeah, the 250F it felt a much smaller car, much more nimble space frame. And it just was smaller, easier. I mean, a car that raced between 1954 and 1960. They didn't really evolve too quickly back in those days. Drum brakes, the Dion rear axle, the one I drove was very happy on three wheels, waving its inside front wheel up in the air and, and incredibly drivable. Um, no doubt about it. Uh, they, we had to push start it away. That beautiful tail end on it was sculpted around the fuel tank because that was a key aspect of all of these cars. You know, you were sitting in a lot of fuel. The outstanding challenge in that, although I found it easier to reset my brain on it, was that the brake and the throttle were the wrong way round, or the other way round, um, shall we say, in that the brake was on the right and the throttle in the middle. So when you, as I found out, if it all started getting a little bit, too slidey and, and you panicked, you would immediately default to pressing what you thought was the brake and hit the throttle and go even faster. So you really did have to change the chip <laughs> for that one um, and quite quickly get in, into the hang of, you know, but as with so many of the cars of that phase, it was getting it in the right gear, you know, and, and, and getting it into a corner was, was a dominant part of the lap. But uh, there's no doubt about it, the 250 was a really nimble, great little car. I mean, it didn't feel as engineered as the might of that Mercedes. And it had a, you know, had a bit less power. But it, it was, I could understand why he, Sir Sterling Moss described it also as the best front engine car he ever drove. Now, there's one more front engine car I'd love to ask you about. And that's Mike Hawthorne's 1958 Ferrari Dino 246, the car in which he beat Sterling to the championship by one point. How was that? How did it compare to the Maserati? It felt slightly sort of more together. Um, it was a 1960 car, of course, in, um, well, it was sort of fifth, late 50s in, into early 60s. Sweet little engine in it, that, that 246. Uh, it, it was, a, what was that, 2.4 litre V6, that one. And very, again, very drivable. I was doing a feature on my Cawthorn. So I drove that in a bow tie and leather jacket as he always used to race. And the outstanding aspect of all of those cars is the visibility you have of the racetrack because you, you do really sit on them rather than in them. And so you, you feel a total command, lovely little gearbox. Gave me a lot of confidence straight away, even though the track was a bit wet when I drove that car at Silverstone. And any time you drive a Ferrari is great. I remember there was, a, was the car that had the prop shaft coming sort of horror at a slight angle through the cockpit. And again, with all of those front engine cars, you can't help but feel you're sitting on a little seat um, with your legs splayed out and your sensitive parts extremely exposed to gearboxes and prop shafts and universal joints just underneath you. And you sort of think, I hope that lot doesn't all come apart because um, that's, uh, that's going to ruin the rest of my life um, <laughs> if it doesn't kill me. Because you do feel that, you know, you are sitting on top of a lot of turning parts. And again, just fuel everywhere, all around you. But a, a beautiful simplicity with the controls, with the 
dials, the dashboard. You know, it's a great responsibility. When people let you in these cars, it's because they trust you and they trust that you won't crash it. I did uh, take the front wing off a, a Force India once. So the only time I've ever damaged any of those 54 cars that I've that I've driven through uh, different F1 cars. But um, you won't crash it. You won't over rev it. You won't start dropping the clutch and trying to, you know, do practice starts or something like that. You they they put a lot of trust in you that you will hand it back in the same condition that you were given it as a great privilege. Because you know a, a lot of like when I drove the Braun at Goodwood, they said to me, "Please don't do donuts at the bottom or the top, whatever." We have one of everything for this car, and it's on it. <laughs> so if you. If anything goes wrong, it will not yeah. run and we will disappoint people. No pressure. Just one quick question about uh, front engine cars in general. Do they require a different style to a rear engine car? Is it a lot more tail happy? Yeah, they did tend to be pretty tail happy. Um, not as understeery, not as front sliding as you might imagine. And I think that's because they probably set them up to get whatever the you know, straight six, straight eight, V12 or whatever was in the front of it, into the corners, skinny tires. So you, you even though you didn't really have a whole lot of horsepower, you you had enough to break the rear loose in the car uh, and steer it on the throttle. I mean, the 250F, you, you used the throttle pedal as much as the steering wheel to turn the car. Let's go on to the 1960s, the swinging 60s, when anything seems possible. Man walks on the moon for the first time. England win the World Cup. The Beatles are idolised on both sides of the Atlantic. And the first heart transplant takes place. In F1, it's the decade of unstoppable innovation. Engines go from front to back. And for some people, driving isn't enough. Jack Brabham and Bruce McLaren build their own cars, as does Dan Gurney. And Martin, you've driven Gurney's Eagle Mark I from 1966-67, a beautiful car. Oh, that's got to be the most beautiful F1 car, hasn't it, in existence. That blue eagle with sort of the beak on it and the, the V12 motor, the Westlake V12 in the back, a car that Dan Gurney himself won the Belgian Grand Prix. And my guys at Sky said to me, right, so, you know, we're getting near towards 50 cars at this point. Let's start thinking about the ones you really want to drive. And that was really quite high on my list because it's just such a stunning looking car. And so I, I found out who owned it. It was in America. And I, I called them and said, you know, is there any chance when I'm over in Austin or, or something, can I, is there any chance we could come around and I'll, I'd love to drive that car for television, for Sky F1. And they were like, yeah, sure, it would be great. I said, I, I, you probably never heard of me, but I'm, you know, I, I blah, blah, blah. They're like, yeah, we know your name. So, wonderfully, it was coming our way over to the UK for Goodwood. So I got to drive that and Sterling's T53 as well for good measure. Cooper, they got that car too, uh, for good measure, up the hill at, uh, at Goodwood. So, yeah, absolutely. The, it couldn't have been, it was the perfect timing for my call. And I sat in it. Dan Gurney was a very tall man and that car was built for him, unsurprisingly. So I could barely reach the pedals. And, I, and we packed me out with some foam. I remember you in this car. Yeah. So I could reach the pedals and the wheel. But as I accelerated off the line, I just sunk back into all of this foam because it had a, a fair turn of speed. And you always want to put a good show on for the crowd there at Goodwood up the hill. And I realized that I was going further further backwards. I couldn't reach the pedals. I couldn't reach the steering wheel every time I accelerated hard. So we managed to sort that out a little bit. But the sound of it... now. A really key thing is when you're in any racing car, it sounds a lot different to what it does outside because inside, a lot of the sound is dominated by the mechanical turning over of the engine, the camshafts, piston, the combustion really through the air box or whatever. And just a general mechanical noise. And something like a DFV, COSI Formula 1 engine has got a highly distinctive sort of sound and feel to it and, and the feedback. Whereas when you're outside a car, it's dominated by the exhaust note that you can hear rather than the mechanical. So, um, But I, even, even I could hear the V12 rasp of that as I was going up the hill. I mean, what a privilege to drive that car. It just, 
it's the sort of thing. I was just taking pictures of it at the top of the hill at Goodwood. I drove it each day and it was faultless. And I just wanted to keep, whichever way you looked at that car, the engine, the chassis, you know, the, the front of it, the, just the exhaust. The exhaust themselves were a work of art. Um, it, it was a beauty. How much had the tech come on in the eight years between that car and the Ferrari Dino of Hawthorne? It felt like a completely different style of racing, I would have thought, a different concept altogether. You know, those cars in the 50s felt quite agricultural and he really heavy. And it was about what they got available to them rather than what they necessarily thought they might be able to design. Um, all of a sudden, you've got something that, you know, that is monocoque and stressed engines and independent suspension and better brakes and you know whilst they still feel quite antiquated compared to anything in the last 20 years um, it was a step change now perhaps the greatest pioneer of them all was colin chapman and his signature car the lotus 49 well you've driven the 49b from 1967 haven't you that is the car I've driven uh, three or four Lotuses. Um, that was a nice story, the 49B. We took it back to Zanvor, uh, again for Sky F1, with its current owner, Adrian Newey. Now, this car won its inaugural Grand Prix at Zanvor in the hands of the great Jim Clark. And it's also a car that when he was a youngster, that Adrian Newey had a Tamiya kit of, and it got him interest because it had moving suspension and it, all the parts were named. He got him interested in cars and suspension and design and full circle he ends up owning the real thing and treasures it rebuilt it himself uh, as well and we took it to Zanvor and had a right old thrash round Zanvor in it the old the old one not, obviously not the new one that was hoping to have a, a Grand Prix around now um, so it, it was a, a really lovely story and a really lovely car so now you've got the Cosworth behind you that very distinctive mechanical sound and, and intake sound of the of that great engine the car looked i have to say flimsy is probably a bit unkind but definitely minimal in some respects and, and you see the way that the front upright is attached to the lower front wishbone by a circlip and it was definitely built down to a weight designed by colin chapman and morris philippe who was my first engineer in formula one when i joined tyrrell a great little car, very nimble, plenty of grip, big fat tyres. Of course, that era started sprouting wings, didn't they? And those really high wings as well that thankfully didn't last too long. And sponsorship. The car was in its gold leaf colours and, you know, it was, it was a, a big change for Formula One, that. Tell us a little bit about the engine in the back of that Lotus, the DFV, because it, it went on to last for 19 seasons in Formula One. And um, it's a lovely story because you've obviously driven that car, but the last Grand Prix that that DFV did was the Australian Grand Prix of 1985 in a car driven by your good self. How much did the engine improve over that time? It still had the same distinctive qualities, um, the same mechanical sound, with all of its cam chains and uh, what have you on on the front of it, the intake, the I think it was a DFY. I thought I thought the last race I did in that was at the Nurburgring uh, in the Tyrrell with the DFY, but it gained a lot of horsepower. I think the last one I drove had five hundred and twenty odd horsepower, whereas the one in Adrian's car I know was near a sort of late three hundreds. I'd have thought four hundred. Yeah, it was very tractable very drivable, good centre of gravity. It had all the attributes they needed. And it was customer teams or, or small teams could buy one and go racing and have it refurbished quite easily. It, it was, you know, it, it wasn't exactly bulletproof reliability wise, but for the era, I think it was considered reliable, fuel efficient, installation good, stiffness good. It, it had a bit of everything you'd want when you were designing a car back in those days. And as you said, these cars started to sprout wings, but it was really the last one before aero became a massive factor. And does a car without downforce require less skill to drive quickly than one with downforce? I would say a car without downforce requires more skill. And when you see... Fangio and Moss controlling the Mercedes or such like and the way they used to drift the cars and control the cars I, I think the driver was 
playing a tune on the pedals and the steering wheel and particularly the throttle and occasionally the gearbox that the downforce squashes out to a certain extent you know you you can lean on the downforce the the sidewall of the tire the contact part so it's different and you certainly had to especially in the ground effect days believe the car was going to stick to answer your question right off the top of my head i would have thought dancing the car was more of a a skill, a deftness, if you like, uh, a light touch than particularly like the very latest cars that are absolutely nailed to the racetrack. But the drivers are not, the drivers are no less skillful. They just transfer their skills to now it's precision. You know, when I raced in the early 80s, if you arrived into the apex of the corner in the right gear, pointing in the right direction, that was a reasonable start to that corner. Now, if you break two meters too early or you don't rotate the car on the apex you've blown it so that they've transferred their skills from bravery through to fundamental control through to you know minute adjustments uh, and and detail that perhaps we never used to have to worry about on to the 1970s the oil crisis of 1973 takes its toll watergate brings down a u.s president video cassette recorders become commercially available, and the first mobile phone call is transmitted in 1973. In F1, aerodynamics start to take centre stage. Wings are primitive at first, but as the understanding of aerodynamics grows, lap times fall. And first up, Martin, tell us about the BRM P160. Yeah, I wanted to do that. We're making a feature at Monza, and a friend of mine, Richard Mill, owns that car, and so we managed to... I mean, there was a nervous man because can you imagine trying to repair that V12 engine should it blow itself to bits? And we're starting now, power starting to grow and the complexity of the engine. So so is the fuel and the fuel tanks. And uh, my overriding memory is you're sort of sitting in a cigar tube, no seatbelt still, for a lot of those cars until the very late 60s. Um, the, the, those those sort of cars, but uh, Jackie Stewart was pushing hard, and now you're starting to get seat belts and that. But you, you're still incredibly exposed, and just sitting with your. Uh, I mean, even even in the '58 Dino 246, I remember saying uh, uh, in the piece for uh, Hawthorne's car, you the only place to rest your elbows is on on a fuel tank, basically either side of you. But now, as the power grows, they're just surrounding you by fuel. Um, the V12 was lovely, but inevitably would be quite heavy. So I don't think it was the the greatest of F1 cars. Peter Gethin obviously won at Monza, didn't he, with that incredibly tight finish. So that's why we were, and his son was going to drive in it as well. It, it did 50 races and had three wins. And one of the drivers included our own Helmut Marco from Red Bull. <laughs> and it was in that car that Ronnie Peterson car threw up a stone and went through Helmut's visor and blinded him in his left eye, which finished his career, actually, sadly. So it was a, a lovely car. It was misfiring a little bit at the low revs. Then it got up and running, and you, you'll never replace that shrill sound of a V12 at high revs. But it, the car, once again, the car had decent grip with, with its tyres and, and aero and decent power. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it was just... I remember that car when it was, you know, when we used to go to Brands Hatch at the Yardley BRM and all this. It was it was so iconic. But that race was its greatest moment, of course. And um, yeah, I, I, it was one I handed back and then Peter Gethin's son drove it. But uh, the owner was so pleased to get that back in one piece. I can't, uh, I can't tell you enough about that. And of course, just for those people listening, that race that you keep referring to, Monza 71, closest finish in Formula One history with the top five covered by 0.6 of a second. But another guy who drove that car, Nicky Lauda, in 1973, Nicky's second full season of Formula One, is also a driver you raced against in Formula One. And I wanted to ask, how big a gulf is it between this car one of Nicky's early cars, and then a car that he would have been racing against you in the mid-80s? Yeah, uh, huge, basically. You know, by the time we've got into carbon chassis and a much, uh, although the cars had very much straight lines on them in the 80s, 
the era, it, you know, they did start to understand Venturi's a bit more and uh, wings and cooling and, you know, the, the, the engine and gearbox became more sophisticated, the systems, uh, you're sitting much more inside the car now. So the 80s cars, although we still managed to hurt ourselves quite frequently, um, development did gallop, start galloping on. So in the 50s, you know, cars would race for up to six seasons. Now we're starting to, in the 80s, you're starting to get to cars that race for one or two seasons, absolute maximum, because the rate of change is massive. One more car from the 70s, the Ferrari 312 B3. Again, Nicky Lauda's car. <laughs> History of Nicky Lauda's Formula One cars, but a special Ferrari because what they hadn't won the title since, what was it 1964? And this was a car that started giving them hope again, wasn't it? Yeah. Now, this feature came up. Zach Brown owned both these cars at the time. The Rush movie was coming out. So we were at Snetterton and we got the McLaren M23, it would be, wouldn't it? And this Ferrari 312, because we were doing a little feature around Hunt v. Lauda in the Rush movie. Uh, yeah, flat 12. I spoke to Nicky about this car after I'd driven it. I said, ah, I drove your car last week, your old car. And he remembered it quite clearly. It was quite quirky inside. And it had, I said, Did it, it, it surely didn't have that, what looked like a circuit breaker from home uh, on the dashboard. He said, yeah, it did. And the switches, it was... Um, the one thing that really struck me was you were surrounded by four fuel tanks because now power's still growing, of course, flat 12 engine in the back of that car. You had a fuel tank above your knees running all the way down each side of you and behind you. You were literally in a bath of fuel. No wonder those cars, whenever you know you watch back some of the old races, used to just burn horribly. Uh, well, you were just sitting in a fuel tank. But it, it, it was a nice car. It, it, it worked well. A little bit floppy here and there. It had 10 wins, that car, with Ix and Lauda. And it was a good car. There's no doubt about it. That falls into the category of cars that give you a bit of confidence and, and have got an um, innate balance to them. The 1980s, the decade of excess. Thriller becomes the best-selling album of all time. Yuppies become a thing, and Britain Tim Berners-Lee discovers the World Wide Web. In F1, turbos dominate, producing upwards of 1,500 brake horsepower in qualifying trim and using qualifying tyres. The cars are fiercely demanding to drive. And the car that encapsulates the era best of all is the McLaren MP44 from 1988. I remember you driving the car in Brazil last year, Martin. Many of the people watching were crying. Hey, that was a wonderful opportunity because the, the first Formula car I ever drove was the MP4-1 uh, in 1983 when Senna, Ed and Senna, Stefan Beloff and myself were invited along to have a go, which was pretty special. And my 54th car, not hopefully not my last, was the MP44, actually, the way it's turned out. I wanted to drive that car. It had been on, along with the Gurney V12 Westlake. Um, the one I haven't driven so far is the 92 Williams FW14B, I think it is, that was the bane of my life when I was a, a Benetton works driver. Otherwise, it was so dominant that year, it sort of took the shine off. Ah, uh, yeah, at Benetton. But the MP44 Honda, I mean, V6, had about 650 horsepower, very low line, Steve Nichols car, very low line car. And you, and you felt that, you li you're lying down in it. Again, it's quite high up out of the cockpit though. I mean, I'm, I'm one meter 73, five feet eight and 79 kilos plus. No, no, no I'm tax. sure not, not <laughs> <laughs> And... If I'd have been any bigger, I couldn't have got in the car. Senna was about the same size as me. I couldn't have got in the thing. It was built to minimal cockpit sizes. The elbows needed to fit somewhere. And we ran it and the shenanigans we had to go through. Were we on the track? Were we not? The rain was coming. We had, it had one set of wheels, but rain was threatened. Heavy rain was threatened. So to get the tyres changed to wets to dries was about a three, four hour job. So we had to commit to slicks with rain. It was raining at the time, we, but we looked at the weather forecast like, right, put the slicks on. Three hours later, you know, the slicks are on because, you know, you just don't have loads of wheels sitting around for cars like that. And thank God it was dry. I was terrified, literally, in this precious car in Ayrton Senna's back garden. 
in, in San Paulo, uh, into Lagos, a few miles from where his grave is, where he won races for McLaren. And it was just a, the most brilliant opportunity in a car that won 15 out of 16 races. There were six times it was over a second faster than the rest of the field in qualifying and only four retirements. It was the most extraordinary car. And the weird thing is I had a small hand in why it didn't win 16 out of 16, but I'm not sure if we've got time to go into that story. <laughs> I've got a, a couple of questions about it in that Gordon Murray, who was the technical director at McLaren in 88, told me once that that MP44 is just an evolution of the Brabham BT55 from 1986, which was a very low-lying car. Yep. And one of the things Derek Warwick said he struggled with in that Brabham was he said he couldn't breathe because of the driving position. Can you relate to what Derek was saying, having driven the car now? Yes, I don't think it was quite as extreme as the Brabham because there they sort of had the chin bar of their helmet literally pressed into their breastplate uh, and an extreme sort of laid-back position. It was towards that way, um, but also you feel like you've got such wonderful view because you've got this perspex screen and you've got such wonderful view of the racetrack and the curbs and the, and the apexes. But you are, again, you were sitting quite a long way out of it because there wasn't a whole lot to the car, but it all just worked, didn't it? But if you, again, if you look at the aero, there's just the straight lines and the side pods. But it's one of those, it, it's a piece of art, should be on a wall in a museum somewhere, uh, one of them, because it, it's just so utterly beautiful. Nothing on it that didn't need to be there. No twists and turns, no, you know, 100-piece barge boards, whatever, hanging off the side of it. The purity of the car and the way it worked and the way it drove. And it gave you quite a push in the back when that Honda came to life. Um, it was just all at one, the car. And the driving position was a compromise, but you, you could get around it. What was the single most impressive thing about the car? I would say how together it all felt. Chassis, aero, engine, gearbox, just a very together racing car that you immediately felt you could build on every lap, every corner. As so ha often happens with these things, you know, shall, will we get out, when we get out, whatever. And then all of a sudden I got six or eight laps or something. And, and you immediately think, okay, next time I'm going to come through there and gear up. Next time I'm not going to brake so hard. Next time I'm not going to brake at all. You just immediately start the racing driver stuff, uh, even though you're making a piece of television um, or, and you're protecting a really precious car. It just makes you feel like you, uh, you know, getting ready to go racing. What a wonderful car. One final question about the 80s. Something you touched on actually at the top was the six-wheeled Williams, the FW08B. I read that Frank Durney said it was going to be Williams' answer to not having a turbo engine. But what an extraordinary looking car. What are your memories of it? My memories are I had wonderful traction, unsurprisingly, with four rear wheels. It's quite a heavy, quite a long car with massive Venturi on the side pods because it's so long. And I was trying to compare it with the car I ran at the same time for Tyrrell, the Tyrrell 012. And I think it would have, it was heavy with all the extra transmission and length and what have you. But, and they were going to have to do something about that. But I think it, it certainly would have, absolutely smashed to bits any other normally aspirated cars around in terms of pace and drivability and it didn't need any front wings it had so the center of pressure underneath was so good can you imagine how good the racing would be if you didn't have a you know we keep changing the front wings on the current cars to try to improve racing this thing didn't even need a front wing at all so you'd be able to follow so closely um I, it would have been really quick but i suspect in the end, the, the DFV would have run out of steam quite quickly against the turbos. And it wasn't enough to stop Alan Jones going into retirement, was it? He tested it in November of 81 and then disappeared off to Australia yeah. and didn't come home. Or didn't come back, should I say. Yeah. The 1990s are characterised by the rise in multiculturalism and international scandals. Remember the name Monica Lewinsky? The first Harry Potter story is published and Titanic is the decade's highest grossing film. In F1, normally aspirated engines are the norm. Ferrari come oh so close to a world driver's title with Alain Prost, while the deaths of Roland Ratzenberger and Ayrton Senna horrify the watching world. 
Martin, you raced a lot of cars in the 90s. Which was your favourite and why? The easy answer really is the, of the, the ones that I raced is the B192 from Benetton. Uh, we used it from the Spanish Grand Prix onwards. I remember, do, I was the first one to test that. I can remember at Silverstone going around. We'd had the B191 we'd been using and got out of the car uh, and there stood uh, Ross Braun, Pat Simmons, Tom Walkinshaw, eagerly waiting to hear from me what it was like. I said, it's very good. Car feels good. It's a, ste- it's a step forward. And it was a step forward. I mean, it, the 191 was fine. And uh, you can't say there was a whole load of new bits on the 192. It was just a better car all round, really, with the HB engine in it, Ford HB, V8. It was good. But it was a very analogue car, you know, manual shift, no power steering, throttle cable, um, you know, no no electronic throttle or anything like that. It was just a very together, straightforward racing car that where you could go a bit like a Formula Ford. You could go to an event and you might tweak the spring rate or you might tweak the roll bar stiffness a little bit and just fine tune it. It was a, a great F1 car for all day, every day. The problem is it was up against a Williams with uh, paddle shift gearboxes and uh, they would have had back then, they must have had, of course, active suspension and, and a car that was so massively more complex and electronic than our car that we did keep it in sight from time to time. Shumi won the 92 Spa Grand Prix, which I should have won had I pitted a lap earlier and I should have won the Canadian Grand Prix and it had the transmission not failed. But we scored 11 podiums in the car, six for Michael, five for me. And it was just a great car. And and I've driven it again since for TV. And it's still a great car. Um, It's just, yeah, it's just uh, one of those cars that feels like it's an extension of you. You're seat belted into it. And it's some of you will hear me say on these TV features. But when I really feel that, I I just feel that because you're strapped in so tight by six belts into a really stiff carbon chassis the engine and gearbox is mounted equally stiffly no bushes or anything in the suspension no no rubber mounts everything is mounted in a very rigid way and then you've got a gear rod and a throttle cable you directly link you can feel the dog rings going in on the gear shifts Senna's car was the same the MP44 actually but you feel very much part of that car you 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 are just part of the operating system of that mechanical operating system of that car. It's one of the sort of paradoxes, isn't it, that it was quite as analog as it was because John Barnard actually laid out the 92 Benetton. And of course, he was the guy that introduced semi-automatic gearboxes at Ferrari in 89. And yet he didn't include it on this car. No, I don't, it hadn't been a, it been sort of quite troublesome on the 89 car, hadn't it? But I don't know if the budget wasn't there or what really, but yeah, it was... Um, I mean, all it was was a highly developed, grown-up version of the Lotus 49B, wasn't it? It was the it was just a much better version of that with an HB Cosworth instead of a DFE and a Hewlett and Box hanging on the back of it. How much better was this car, the 92 Benetton, than the last car that you actually raced, the 96 Jordan? How had things come on in the intervening years? Um, they moved on aerodynamically. We had the, the Peugeot V10 in the back of the Jordan, fully, you know, with the with the paddle shift gearboxes and aer- aero moved on quite a long way. So yeah, development was rapid, wasn't it? And and continues to be so in many respects so through through these phases. So by now, teams, you know, that you didn't sort of have, let's go back to the 250F from 1954 to 1960 with some tweaks each winter. By now, you've got heavyweight teams, a lot of people involved, a lot of resource, a lot of budget, bringing out updates every three or four races, or even today, every race, they'll bring an aero update to the track. So unsurprisingly, and with technology and materials and sensors on the cars, simulation tools, and all of the data and knowledge they've now got, unsurprisingly, and the resource, they the development race has ramped up massively. So, uh, and we saw that beginning in uh, certainly in the 90s. 
The 2000s are marked by the exponential growth of the internet and the global economy. Until that is, there is a financial crash in 2008. Concorde flies its last commercial flight, and there's international condemnation when terrorists deliberately fly two planes into New York's World Trade Center. In F1, horizons are expanded with races in the Middle East and China for the first time. On track, the decade is dominated by Ferrari. Michael Schumacher wins five titles with the team, and Kimi Raikkonen won, and the Scuderia takes seven constructors' titles. Martin, where better to begin our look into the 2000s than with the car in which Schumacher delivered his first driver's title for the team, the Ferrari F1 2000. Yeah, it was his third title, wasn't it, after his um, two Benetton ones, but the first one for Ferrari, and Ferrari's first Constructors' Championship for 21 years, as you say. Um, That car had 10 wins, uh, 21 podiums, Rubens Barrichello also driving it. This feature, there's a friend of mine, Paul Osborne, owned these two cars. Um, This feature was for a magazine, actually, mostly, but we covered it on TV as well, and was to compare the two cars, uh, the My 92 Benetton and this 2000 F1 Ferrari. More than anything, I'd never driven a Ferrari Formula One car at this point, and I was desperate. I know it's only carbon fibre and a different colour, but I was desperate to drive a Ferrari. So that was why I was pushing so hard for this. But it it was quite interesting to get out of my analogue Benetton and into this car that was eight years younger, the the Ferrari, and just how much more drivable, how much more grip, how much power with a gearbox and all that sort of thing. You know, the the 192, I was still dominated by getting the gears sorted out. The Ferrari was just miles faster and easier to drive in many respects. Um, So that was what that feature, how I ended up driving those two on that particular day. Um, And that was it. I remember leaving the pit lane and actually shouting out, yes, I'm on track in a Ferrari. Now, when I'm doing these features, because I'm we often we've got limited track time because of the track, because people don't want their precious cars worn out or when I drive more modern F1 cars, you're only allowed to do, you know, 100 kilometers or something. And they've got to do other things within that. So literally five or six laps sometimes. So I'm GoPro up three or four different mics in my helmet because different engine specifications, whether it's V8, V10, V12, whether you're revving to 19,000 or 10,000 revs, or it's really hard to get good clarity with what I'm saying. So I go out of the pits in a car I've never driven before, GoPros everywhere, and I have to start talking straight away because I'm making TV features out of it. They want content. No good me trundling around for three or four laps and then have one lap of talking. And, and back in the day before GoPros, we used to do what they call dirty runs and clean runs. So we'd have big cameras on the car um, for the onboard stuff, come in, take all that off, and then go and do the same runs again for the offboard shots with the, without the cameras on. So you've got a much prettier thing. Now we can sneak GoPros under mirrors and on suspension and that and not have to do those two different types of runs. But nonetheless, I am chatting away as I leave the pit lane because I have to and because I need to. Uh, But involuntarily, I went, yes, I'm on the track in a Ferrari. That's how much it meant to me. I've driven several since, but that meant a great deal to me that day. And just uh, going slightly left field, but Ferrari is, of course, the only team that's been around since 1950. Your thoughts on their importance to Formula One, clearly important to Martin Brundle and racing drivers, but their importance to Formula One? Uh, well, it's essential that they're around, isn't it? I don't think that necessarily means they should be given the high ground on on any anything and everything, um, whether it's technical vetoes or, or whatever. But uh, I think they are recognised as being the primary importance of Formula One, and, and so they should be. And they have the, the you know the the history and heritage of F one is so important. It, it is seventy years old this year. It is a global business third only to the Olympics and the World Cup, which obviously happen every four years, if we're lucky. And you know what? In this lockdown period, we've had so much to look back on, haven't we? Of that history and heritage. What a rich tapestry of stories and images and tragedies and successes and glories we, we have to look back on, as we are doing in this podcast. And um, And Ferrari are a fundamental cornerstone of that. Okay, now I want to ask you 
the best race that you've ever commentated on? Um, I would say they usually involve wet, dry races. Um, 2008 Brazil Brilliant. was a bit of a stonker when Felipe won the championship for a few seconds before Lewis somehow. I was so hoping you were going to say that because I wanted to ask you about the MP4 23. <laughs> uh, well done. <laughs> Segwaying into that, <laughs> you old pro. Um, yes, so Lewis takes the mickey out of me again on this because he goes, man, whichever car you drive, you say is the best car you've ever driven. I'm like, okay, well, maybe that's what I felt at the time because two of his cars are the best cars I've ever driven. And let's remember the best drivers end up getting in the best cars. That was 2008, wasn't it? Now, remember they started that season and the car had to be inspected by the FIA because the previous season was the scandal, wasn't it? The spy scandal between Mercedes and McLaren and, and Ferrari uh, to make sure there was no Ferrari IP on it, but it was it was a tremendous car. It had six wins out of the eighteen races. It didn't. It wasn't dominant in that respect. A two point four liter Merc V eight in the back of it, put into nineteen thousand revs. Now, the two point four V eights they didn't really impress me that much. They were all noise and top end power without a lot of torque. Felt like they wouldn't pull the skin off a rice pudding if you weren't pulling sort of north of 16,000 revs or something. Um, so they're, they're not really the most impressive engines I've ever driven, those, those 2.4s. But that car, the aero on that car, it was just one great big channel of air, wasn't it, and downforce. And we were doing a feature driving different Mercedes, uh, McLarens, well, Mercedes engine, this particular one, but uh, at Silverstone. And I, I bagged this car, the 2008. I wanted to drive that car. It was on a set of ancient grooved Bridgestones. And I took off and this thing stuck to the road like you can't imagine. It literally became an extension of my mind. And now they start coming on the road. Indy Lyle, who, who was running the cars that day from McLaren, was like, slow down, slow down, come in now, come in now. Because I was going through turn one at Silverstone and then on the new track, flat out, didn't lift the throttle. This thing gave me so much confidence. It was unbelievable. I've never felt a car stick like that until I drove one of the hybrid cars um, more recently. Uh, brilliant thing. It just, just felt like it was on rails and would never fly off the track. And I'm sure, I'm sure you could uh, under pressure and in wheel-to-wheel -wheel action. But, uh, you know, Lewis, Lewis sneaked the championship in that car. Although, interestingly, didn't... Um, Ferrari actually won the Constructors title that year, I think. I don't think McLaren won the Constructors in that car. No, they didn't. Ferrari did. And Massa won the title for 38 seconds or whatever it was, didn't he? But yeah. Martin, what I'm really interested is to hear you say that this car inspired so much confidence because, yes, Lewis wins the title, but his teammate, Heike Kovalainen, didn't do anything outstanding in it. He got one pole position at Silverstone and then finished seventh in the standing. So... I don't know what that tells you about the car, or maybe it tells you more about Heike Kovalainen. I don't know. Well, I think Heike sort of Heike was better than he was the look that year, and I think he lost confidence and sort of lost his way a little bit up against the might of Lewis. I think what it tells you is that you know pushing a car to nine and a half tenths, making a TV feature, is not like pushing a car to ten tenths. Uh, up against the finest in the world and, and the finest teams in the world. So, you know, Lewis made it talk. And Lewis really could have and should have won the 2007 World Championship, but for some bad luck here and there. So somehow we, he made it through in 2008. And, and you know, if you think of his victory that year at Wet Silverstone, one of the most amazing drives I've ever seen in, 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 at Silverstone that day, then he, he deserved it, but he, he was making the car talk and I can understand why. On to the 2010s, when smartphones and tablets are the headline accessory. 4G is rolled out around the world and London becomes the first city to host the Olympic Games three times. In F1, Sebastian Vettel becomes the youngest ever world champion in 2010. Incremental gains are the buzzwords in design offices prior to the turbo hybrid era being introduced in 2014. Martin, Red Bull dominated the early part of this decade and you drove their second title winner, the RB7 from 2011. One of the most impressive aspects of this car was the exhaust blown diffuser, where the exhaust gases were directed in such a way to maximise downforce from the rear of the car. 
How hard was it to maximize this from inside the cockpit? Did it require a slightly different throttle application? What it gave you was wonderful grip. Um, now, we put together, we we're doing an overtaking feature on Sky F1. So somehow we put together access to Silverstone, a works driver in the shape of Mark Webber present and two running RB7s, weren't they? You know, the logistics, helicams, drones, all the crew, everything. So I could do, with Mark, show the typical ways to overtake in Formula One, all the techniques, all the quirky stuff, and it poured with rain. I mean, poured with rain. It nearly got cancelled. I remember keep going back to Mark in the, and he's a good lad, Mark, good mate of mine now. I didn't know him quite so well back then, but I'm like, sorry about this, mate. If you could just give us, can you give us another hour? Do you mind? And he was like, yeah, mate, yeah. And he, and he was just sort of half asleep. Suddenly it cleared a bit and out we went. And I just couldn't believe how much grip the car had. It had so much traction. And that was, even in those conditions with a, an old geezer like me driving here, I remember Mark saying to me when we went in for the first, you know, when we, we'd done our first bit of filming, he, he, we, would, we could talk to each other as we were going around. So we could talk to each other in the, in the garage. He went, when was the last time you were in an F1 car, mate? I said, well, I don't know, a year, 18 months ago? Hmm. And I know what he meant because we were hustling around from minute one and I felt confident in that car. And it was, I think it's the blown diffusers, the way that the exhaust could generate downforce. And it just gave me so much confidence to floor the throttle. And again, not a huge amount of torque from those 2.4s, but I can see exactly why that car won a world championship. And again, very nimble, very together with the added bonus of this sort of you can adjust your rear grip with your throttle pedal, but only in a positive way, not in a negative way. Because when we used to have blown diffusers in the turbo days, you know, you could actually get a car to fly off the road if you lifted off the throttle when you were all loaded up with grip. This only seemed to really work in one direction. It was brilliant. So it was like traction control, really, without being traction control. Yeah, it just, yeah, you didn't need to, well, yes, in a way, but um, you didn't need to control the traction because it just had so much of it. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it didn't appear that it was going to spin its wheels. You know, that car won 12 out of 19 races. What did uh, Seb call his kinky Kylie? I don't think I was driving <laughs> kinky Kylie. And of course, they had Kurs by then as well, didn't they? I don't know if yeah. Renault, uh, if uh, Red Bull were running it that year, but the Kurs, I, I like to try those systems, Kurs and F Ducks and DRS, drag reduction system, rear wings now. Uh, they're not quite the switch you'd imagine. It's not like, not like this instant hit. It's like a big hand of God just pushing you along nicely. You, you transition into the extra speed. It doesn't necessarily just turn up as an instant hit. Well, Martin, look, let's bring it. We've, we've raced through six decades. Let's bring it up to the current now with a Lewis Hamilton championship Mercedes from 2015, the W06. A stunning car. What was it? 16 out of 19 wins. Just <laughs> You're going to tell me it was the best F1 car you've ever driven because that's what you told Lewis. But what really <laughs> yeah. stood out? Um, just how together the car was. Now, here was another day where it rained and I'd been told that morning, this car is needed tomorrow morning in the factory for serious work, right? You must not damage this car. And it started to pour with rain. So I left the pit lane and my brain hurt at this point because I'm now driving a hugely complex car. I have had instruction. I've had documents sent through to me in advance. I've had instruction about the steering wheel and, and how the car functions and and all of that. There's so much going on. Once again, I'm all GoPro'd up and mic'd up and I've got to start talking as I leave the pit lane. But actually, you could drive out of the pits like you were going to Tesco's to get some shopping. Uh, it was so together. And off we go. And it was stone cold, but the brakes still felt pretty good. And then I accelerated down the straight at Silverstone and it just kept going. I got a beep in my ear to tell me when to shift gear, which you become second nature within a lap. And you just had to keep, I just kept pulling gears, get going up the gearbox. And then I realized I was in top gear in eighth and it was still accelerating like crazy. And I'm sure they gave me kind of idiot power level, not the sort of stuff that Lewis would be expecting in qualifying. 
And I actually lifted off in the end. I got scared. I thought, if I don't, I'm just going to take off. If I keep accelerating like this in the pouring rain, I will either fly off the road or I will take off. Just this relentless talk between the, the 1.6 motor and all of the electrical assistance you've got to go with it. Linear delivery, no holes, no turbo lag, just this relentless acceleration, which is addictive. You, you do get used to it reasonably quickly, but uh, God knows how often I was actually on full throttle in those conditions. Not very much, I'd imagine. Um, so the controls, the car, again, you press the brakes, it slows down in a straight line. You turn the steering wheel and the car turned at the same angle as the steering wheel angle you put in, just so direct. And, so, and I, I'm just, I never raced a car like that, that responded to my input, even in those conditions. And even with cold tires in a way that was so proportional to what I wanted it to do. So, um, but the cars, are, you know, that car was already over 700 kilos, including the driver. The Red Bull was 640 kilos. The wide track one's now well over 725 kilos. So it's gained over 100 kilograms since that, you know, 2011 Red Bull and, and that sort of era. So you've got a very big car. You feel like you're in a big car. You can't really see out of it too well. You're buried right inside it. And so what impresses me about today's drivers is their racecraft in what, for me, is some kind of long wheelbase limousine thing. <laughs> Uh, and no wonder they trip over each other a bit, but they, they're big cars, very big cars to drive. And to, now they're two metres wide to hustle through some spaces. Uh, I, do, I do admire the way they, they race wheel to wheel. When you see Verstappen and Leclerc and, and Hamilton wheel to wheel like that, I tell you, that's skillful stuff. So, Martin, when you look back at the seven decades and all the different cars that you've driven, when was the balance between car performance and driver input at its peak? I would say in the 80s and early 90s, when I think because there were no sensors on the cars, no simulation tools, very little data acquisition, the driver's experience, and that's why I think people like Nicky and Nigel could still win world championships, you know, in their late 30s, early 40s, or whatever it was, where you know, gear ratios and roll bars and suspend, you know, springs and dampers and all that was a combination of trial and error and a combination of experience along with your engineer and what you'd previously done and what worked and, and a gut feeling and, and all that thing where I think that the driver had to drive the car more on his experience and his nous and his instinct and then work with his engineer with really quite limited tools uh, until we started getting a lot of data acquisition in the 90s. Um, and again, I don't say that in any kind of, uh, you know, in my day or whatever, because when I drive these latest cars and I see, I think I sat in, I've driven three of the turb, these hybrids. You know, you can count 40 controls inside the things. And some of them have got sub menus. How they go around Monaco changing brake bias and engine settings and diff settings and goodness knows what, corner by corner, lap by lap. I don't know, frankly, and guide them round at the speed they do. It's absolutely extraordinary. So I think the demand on their mental capacity is far greater than anything I've ever experienced. But I think physically, I mean, the 92 Benetton, for example, was so heavy on the steering wheel. I remember my first quality lap in Barcelona was actually limited by whether I could hold the steering wheel or not through the turn three and through the last corner, keep the steering wheel turned. So some of that physicality has gone. They do have tremendous G-force now under braking, under lateral and, and accelerative. And the cars are still all very hot inside with the confined space and so many heat sources around you. But uh, I think, yeah, that the, those sort of analog days when that's when I think the driver had a greater input into the overall performance of a car. Okay, and final question from me, Martin. I think I know the answer to this, but the car that you most enjoyed driving of the 54 that you've driven? Oh, that's a good question because they've all been great cars and, and, and a privilege to drive them. It's actually one we haven't talked about, which is Senna's Lotus 98T Renault Turbo 1.5 litre 
beautifully put together by Patrick Morgan. And I, I ha- we had it at Donington. We were doing a Senna feature and we had his Tolman there, Tolman uh, and all sorts of things. I had eyes only for Black Beauty. And I think I did two thirds of a Grand Prix distance that day in the car. I, when, even when I turned up, it was being warmed up in that Renault Turbo of that day. And I'd whoop, 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 as it sat in the pits and taking off out of the pits. The wonderful view of the track, car, oh, just superb. Um, that was quite something, that car, the, 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 the grunt that it had and the grip. But, Physical, very physical car to drive, though. Um, but you felt like you were sitting over the front axle because you probably were. Back then, they used to put the driver. It's why most of my era who survived limp because we were put right to the front of the car to counterbalance the weight of the engine. And in an accident, your feet were, you know, right out there. But that's how it felt as you turned the steering wheel in that Lotus 98T. You, you felt you sort of moved into the corner you transitioned into towards the apex as part of the front axle a little bit but that was a beautiful car but the car i'd most want to race would be the Merce- the current mercedes hybrid car as much as there's aspects i don't like about them you spend your racing career trying to improve you know hours and hours and days talking to your engineer and testing 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 umpteen sets of tyres, roll bars, and trying to improve your car a little bit. And then you jump into a car that's like a spaceship and is morphed so far forward, you realise you were just wasting your time trying to find a tenth of a second by, you know, changing the front springs by 50 pounds or something like that. Uh, So you, you, you crave performance and grip and balance. So you would always crave the latest cars. So I understand why the drivers love these cars. The problem is that probably only 20 people in the world can appreciate, and lucky people like me who get to drive them occasionally can appreciate just how amazing they are sometimes. A brilliant answer. And I love your passion, Martin. Thank you so much for your time. And what a trip down memory lane. Marvellous. Thanks, Tom. I really hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Martin gave such great insight into each of the cars and decades. And remember, if you want to see each car, head over to f1.com to see a gallery of each one. There's so much to take away from that conversation. The graphic description of the gearbox on the Mercedes W196, the pedal confusion in the Maserati 250F, all the way through to the noise of the Renault Turbo on Senna's 1986 Lotus being warmed up. Martin, thanks as ever for your time. It was a pleasure to catch up and do this. That's it for this episode, but we'll be back next week with another very special show. Before we go, it's time for me to reach into the virtual mailbag and pick out a couple of your comments about last week's episode with the world's fastest Russian, Danny Kafir. It's amazing how cool and calm a person Danny is, says John Bartley, despite having to overcome so much adversity in his stint at Red Bull. I'm so pleased he's found his feet at Alpha Tauri, and I wish him all the best. Hear, hear, John. Danny is all of those things. And Nava Monga got in touch to say this. Now, I feel like I know the guy who did not care when he crashed into Seb all those years back. He owns everything in his life and on the track. He's someone with great mental strength and perseverance. Well, thanks for the note, Naya. Danny certainly got mental strength. Let's hope he has a competitive car to go with it once we get racing again. Now, remember, if you want to send us a comment, use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid, or you can get me on Twitter. I'm at Tom Clarkson F1. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for listening. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audio Boom. Until next time, stay safe and keep it flat out.